Hi, this is Steve Siebold. I'm here today at the Bone Allen Mansion with Rich Thawley. Uh, Rich is, is one of the co-founders of World Financial Group, going back in this industry all the way back to 1980. And uh, we're just thrilled to have him here to, uh, to uh, talk to us today. Thanks for coming to the mansion, Rich. We it's appreciate it. It's good to be here, Steve. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about good your background? Good to see you sober and out of rehab. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, I, I've been working on it. I've been working through some things. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about your background, both personally and in, in the industry, if you would? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Whenever I talk about my background, I end up turning the whole conversation into how much I adore my wife. So we'll have to let me know. Now, you know get points get for this, right? Because yeah. I've heard you do this. Well, and you've got to score big points yeah, with this. Well, it's, and I'm not doing it to <laughs> score points. I'm doing it because I have an amazing wife. You know, it, 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 kind of a typical American upbringing, you know. I had wonderful parents, and, and uh, I watched them kind of pursue their dream and have things not work out very well, not financially. Great marriage of 57 years before my dad passed. and, and uh, What kind of work did they, did they do? And my dad in a number of things, but he was a general contractor for a while. And, and uh, you know, the, the trades, they go up and they go down, and they go up and they go down. It certainly sure. haven't been as hot as they have been, you know, in the last 25 years in the country. But it's, it was an interesting to watch. But they, they moved from Southern California to Northern California, where I did most of my growing up, to pursue a dream of, raising horses. And they had this vision of breeding quarter horses, which are fast horses, with Appaloosas, which are beautiful horses, and the hope to get a lot of fast, beautiful horses, and genetics being what they are. Like, we got a lot of ugly, slow horses, <laughs> and uh, we really struggled financially. And so I learned my lessons there. But you know, I had 30 horses and 30 stalls and not a lot of resources. It meant my brother and I you know, grew up on a farm working hard. That's an expensive business, isn't it? The horse business. It is, and it's and uh, it's hard to make a go of it. You know, you hear a lot of stories, but without getting into the details, I, there's certain facts you learn when you raise horses as a kid, and that's that the average adult horse produces between 25 and 30 pounds of manure a day, wow. and yeah, and so you take that times 30, and then that's where I first learned that procrastination didn't work. <laughs> right? You could pretend it wasn't happening, but yeah. it was happening. Right. You know, and and, uh, and I loved horses and they're beautiful, but I sometimes used to fantasize that one day there'd be a horse season like there was a deer season, yeah, I'll bet. you know, and, and not that I ever could have done it, but <laughs> the reality of the workload is yeah. tough, but you learn the perspective of time gives you the insight of how much you learn during that time about work ethic and about certain situations and circumstances, about building a business and a farm and something close to the land and watching your parents do that and us all being involved in it as a family business, so to speak. And, and the, the simplicity of the life had a great impact on it. It made me more of a thinker and a reader. You know, and and uh, some of my fondest memories are sitting out back when the work was done and leaning against the tree, almost like out of a movie, right? Right. You know, reading a book and listening to the stream go by and hearing the horses graze in the field. And and that's some of my fondest memories in life, you know, and all of that and the reading and, you know, caused me, I think, to think a little bit beyond, you know, what a lot of the kids around me were doing. And, and I love school, but I love the interaction with people more, even though by nature, I'm pretty shy and, and even more private than I, than I am shy. And uh, I married a woman who's kind of the same way. And uh, we've raised a family of three children, two boys and a girl, and now have three granddaughters. And all of this has been the heartbeat of our life. And she's the foundation of our home and, and of our family. And it's a great thing. Second one just got married. And, you know, and all these things that evolve in life is a natural order of things if you're fortunate. Sure. And so in business, I mean, I used to lay in bed as a kid, like most kids, thinking about what would I be and would it be something and would it be special and would I prosper? Our family never had much. You know, when Cindy and I were married, I moved her into my mobile home. It was three spaces down from my parents' mobile home. Oh, wow. Acorn in the tree, mm. right? And, and uh, the light in her eyes was something I wanted to keep there. You know, my father-in-law, when she helped her move in after our honeymoon, um, had a little twinkle in his eye, but I knew what he meant. And he reached out and shook my hand. And he said to me, with a smile, but seriously, it's all yours now. No pressure. And I felt it in a good way, a motivational way, but I felt it. 
And I felt that responsibility. And, uh, and we've been a team and, you know, we, we, when we were on our honeymoon, we made a list of things that were important to us. We wrote it on a napkin, and I dearly wish we still had the napkin. But it had five things on it. A few of them were we wanted a quality spiritual life. We wanted a home. We wanted a family. But one of the other things that we wrote down, I think maybe is unusual for most couples, is we wanted to find a business we could work in together. Mm. And so we talk <clears throat> about background. That's a critical thing in my background, is that you know, we bring like good marriages do, we bring different things to bear. My wife is really much better at some things than I am, much better. I've never been uncomfortable acknowledging that. <laughs> In fact, I celebrate it, Sure, you know, that I got her to say yes. And, <laughs> and, uh, and that she's so special. And so she had this great capacity for operations, but was skilled with people. And, and then my thing, you know, kind of the drive and competitiveness and you know, and I grew to be comfortable out in front of people and worked hard on mastering the language and communication, especially verbally. And uh, these things grew in us in business. And so when we found this industry and we found the first company we were in, we could start part time and see if it worked out. And then it took off and one thing led to another. And, and uh, people ask me all the time what things make the difference. And you've been asked, is there one thing? Sure. You know, and What's the only the secret? The only thing <laughs> I can tell them is this is not one thing. Yeah. But uh, I do distill it down to four, you know, in, in my head. And the first thing that blessed our lives and continues to bless our lives and will all of our days is Cindy and I were raised in such a way, and then we came to understand it in, in, on our own and made the decision that we were going to lead good lives that we were going to be honest in our dealings with our fellow man, that you weren't going to, we weren't going to lie, we weren't going to cheat, we weren't going to steal, we weren't going to take those kind of shortcuts, that we wanted to live the kind of life that made us feel good about ourselves. And so when people ask me if I could pick only one thing, and I don't, but I would start with character strength. Mm. You know? And so background-wise, in our family, we were raised right. Our parents were married for decades and decades and parted only at death. And we have that example. We would call it, both call it a legacy of love, but it's also a legacy of integrity sure. and honor and hard work and dedication. You know, my wife's mom, Cindy's mom, had a stroke at her birth. Mm. And they were never able to have more children. She was a paraplegic for the rest of her life. Wow. And the doctors only gave her, a, you know, maybe a few years to live. And her father's care and concern for his wife all the rest of those days caused her to live to 82 years old. Wow. When it happened at 27. Hmm. And she had that example, and I had that example during most of our, so far of our married life, of watching that kind of commitment. And I watched it in my own home with my mom and dad. And they're 57 years together. And so you build on that. Now, we also had will to win. We really did want to accomplish something, not just for selfish reasons, though certainly we wanted home and family and be able to prosper and do things like, like I think most good people do. But it was more than that. You know, we wanted to make an impact. We really do believe in our hearts that the reason we're born and given this gift of life is to contribute to the world and make it a better place in all the ways that we can do that, whether it's just being kind to the checker at at a grocery store to something much more prominent in uh, being involved in people's lives. How did you meet Cindy? Cindy and I, I walked on a fluke in college. I agreed to run for office. I'd never even run for homeroom monitor in elementary <laughs> school. Never intrigued me, but I had a friend who talked me into it. And, um, <clears throat> and my job was to go in and talk to sororities and fraternities and the athletic department and ROTC and all oh, those kind of college traditional groups. Yeah. Okay. The university level. Okay. And I walked into a sorority, first time I'd ever been in one. Um, and there were all these remarkable women that were in front of me. <laughs> it's like the greatest thing ever. Yeah. Right? yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's uh, the number of terms you could give it. But the reality was is that it, uh, I, my eyes didn't know where to go. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and then I turned and I was about to speak. And sitting on the floor, three rows in, um, was this very petite, 
um, big brown eyed eight, 18 year old and my blues met her browns and my life was never quite the same again. Wow. It's literally right out of a movie. And you were what, what year in college? I was, I was a junior. And she was a freshman or a sophomore? Freshman. freshman, yeah. Wow. You know, and and uh, I didn't learn this until recently, a few years ago. It's flattering. She found out where my classes were. I get kept bumping into her on campus and thought, I keep bumping into this girl. <laughs> it turned out she was stalking me <laughs> in, in her way. And I uh, thought you'd be stalking her. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 <laughs> yeah, that would make more sense. <laughs> and certainly that day came. Yeah, right. <laughs> but uh, it was fascinating how it happened. And it was a long period of time, over five years. But we remet on an interstate freeway in San Jose, right? We had lost touch. I got up one morning to go down to work in the athletic department at San Jose State. And uh, she'd gotten up because she was back in town and working on her teaching credential with student teaching at elementary school not far from the university. And I literally pulled in front of her in the freeway and looked in the rearview mirror. Wow. I said, who's that? I said, that looks like, and I slowed down so that she had to come up beside me, and there she was. I rolled down my window, and she rolled down hers, and I talked her off a couple of exits later <laughs> and, uh, and got her number, and when we went on that date, it, it, it was over. Boy, if that's not destiny, what is, right? <laughs> yeah, sometimes the Lord is subtle. Sometimes it's two by four right between your eyes. Yeah, jeez. That was one of those. Wow. And so it... Uh, We'd always felt magic around each other. Neither one of us had felt quite the thing with anyone else that we felt with each other. And it just took a little while. She had to wait for me, frankly, to grow up <laughs> and mature yeah. and get a clue. And so I'm grateful she waited. So she stalked you at first, but then it didn't work out all the way. Yeah, that's right. So then, then you had to start stalking her a little yeah, bit. Well, okay. On the freeway, yeah. no less. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's <laughs> more to the story. And it's all Who does that, Rich? But yeah, that's right. <laughs> But we, like I say, we could take the rest of you know, the capacity of whatever chip you have in that, that camera where yeah. we could talk about that. And so, you know, it's interesting because I talk about character and I talk about will to win of the four things. The third one is who I married. When people ask me, what's one of the secrets is who do you marry? That is a big secret. I agree completely. Yeah. And, and uh, to have someone who is your counterpart, who is strong enough to stand up to you and strong enough for you to lean on and. And uh, strong enough to give you tough feedback sometimes, though she always does it privately. And at the same time, to continue to believe in you. And, and what it, how much does it mean to us, Steve? I mean, how do you even measure that? Right. I think it almost takes the next life looking back on it to, I agree to understand completely. how it saved us. And do by, people push back on that, Rich, when you say that in, in front of audiences? It's interesting. Sometimes I've actually gotten emails that said, you talk too much about how much you love your wife. Because uh -huh. when I'm around you, I feel like I don't love my wife enough. <laughs> you know, and how, how do you respond to that? <laughs> yeah, right. You know, yeah. Well, if you feel that, you might want to Oh, you might yeah, that's a tough down, one. Yeah, you don't want to answer that email. Sit right? down quietly and, and <laughs> contemplate why you might feel that way. Yeah. You know, people communicate in different ways about things. I've, right. I've always considered it one of the great privileges of my life to be, one, to be married to Cindy, but two, to talk and about her. In the, right. in, the, in, the, in the ways that I do and the venues that I do. We don't talk enough about our sweethearts. You know, we are increasingly in a world and an environment in this world where it's competitive. And, um, and it never made, that doesn't make any sense to me. The great marriages aren't competitive. Right. They're cooperative. I agree. And like yeah. I say, you don't compete, you celebrate. Right. You know, what you both bring to the table. And um, I'm proud of my girl. I'm thankful that she's better at a number of things than I am. It's been a great blessing to our children who we give our lives for, like most parents. Sure. You know, and, and, and that's the first great step to a great family is marrying the right person. And so you take the character and you take the will and the drive and you take marrying the right person. And then, frank, frankly, the fourth thing I talk about is mentoring. I received at very important times in my life the right kind of mentoring. Even the good fortune, and I consider it really a blessing, but the blessing of having these mentors at the ideal time in their lives, when they were at their best, at the top of their game. And, I just, and Cindy got that, usually from their spouses. Mm -hmm. And so we got this family mentoring that was also business mentoring. 
There's also character mentoring and spiritual mentoring and leadership mentoring. And it took a kid, a poor kid, and a girl that was raised on a farm too, you know, and got us to think, thinking bigger doesn't really do it justice, but thinking very differently. And uh, in a way that we understood our responsibility, you know, and, and the privilege of living a life and standing for right things, you know, and, it, and these were courageous people too, and we learned courage and you know, all of that. You know, we mentioned a guy a few minutes ago that, you know, was we know from right being head of city group and, sure. and uh we were at the same golf course yesterday as a matter of day before right? yesterday. Yeah. Wow. And uh and I watched him, people would come up to him when you're chairman of a major company, people come up to him and they're always trying to curry your favor. And I was sitting sure. next to him at dinner and I was watching people come up and go, it's complimenting constantly. And he, I learned something from him in that moment. He just pleasantly looked at them, smiled, and said, thank you. Thank you. I spent all this time deflecting that stuff. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. No, yeah. not me. Got yeah. you fooled. All that stuff took a lot of energy. Sure. You know, and frankly deflected some nice, sincere things. And I learned in that moment, and when you're around people that really have excelled in life, and you learn those little lessons, it shapes your life. It sure. improves it. You know, I... You hear about that moonshot, the first moonshot that got to the moon, how they had to do constant course corrections. Right. And that's what mentorship did for Cindy and I. It was constant little course corrections, insights, perspectives. We didn't have to learn everything the hard way. I'm a huge fan of borrowing wisdom. Sure. Was there one mentor that stuck out that helped you guys? Yeah, two, them as a couple, Art and Angela Williams. Had a profound impact on us. Who started A.L. Williams. Yeah, correct. the founder of that company. Okay. Um, other leaders put us up into their orbit, and, and they took an interest. And um, I still listen to some of his stuff. So does Cindy. And some of the things that Angela said back then and currently, you know, because we connect and understand and understand what they mean when they say it. And you know, as time and experience teach you these lessons in life and business and from all perspectives, the same counsel takes on a new light, a sure. deeper meaning, a richer meaning, and allows you to become a better teacher and more wise, you know, and, and uh, we build on that. Still building on it. You know, the body ages, but the spirit doesn't. Sure. You know, so Cindy and I will always be youthful until, until the end. And it's, it's, a nice, it's a nice thing to know. If we can just get that body reversal going, we'd have yeah, it now, Rich. That's where we'd nail it. <laughs> we'd, we'd have something we could it. bottle and yeah. sell, you know? <laughs> though, great, though we've learned great lessons as our bodies struggle. True. And it's just like the lessons we learn from our parents as they age. True. So what, what made a farm kid who grew up in, a, in as, you, as you described, in a, you know, kind of a tough situation financially, think that you could, you could do what you've done over the last 40 years? You know, I, I think it's probably a, a product. I mentioned I, I, I was... A voracious reader, I still do. I probably read, I don't know, five to eight, ten books a month. And and so not all of it's deep and reflective and Gandhi or whatever it is, you know. <laughs> Scriptures are daily and some of those things, but I but I read a lot of a lot of fiction and stuff. And I I probably don't really understand how much it impacted my ability to imagine things. And when you're reading, you're playing the movie in your mind that you're reading, that sure. story. You know, and the, and the visualization became more and more a part of me. You know, in fact, you work hard enough at something, people will call you a natural, right? Right. You know, and, and, uh, <laughs> and so I think that helped. Um, my, our parents, both, Cindy and I, both of our parents encouraged us, really encouraged us, and didn't try and limit us. I watched my dad struggle as an entrepreneur, never really um, make it. Some good times, but then some challenging times. And, I, and, I, and part of it is I think you have to find the right thing. But the, the reality of it is when I got around an environment where people really were trying to help you get better and be good at something, took an interest, I really cherished that. My father gave me great counsel when I was a young man. It was mostly related to sports, but I understood it meant things beyond just athletic endeavor. He said, when you, if you really get interested in the sport, and you want to get good at it, find somebody who's really good at it who's willing to teach you. Mm -hmm. sure. And then glue yourself to them. 
don't, and he talked about golf because he tried to learn golf kind of on his own at 40 years old and built all these habits that even lessons were struggling to undo. Sure. And he said, right from the beginning, find a coach and get it right. So you're practicing the right things, that perfect practice concept. Sure. And, and that counsel served me well when we started, first started in business. I, I reached out above me, way, you know, way above me, and sought that out. If I saw someone who I knew was really good in the company and they were sitting with some of their team, I'd just pull up a chair and take notes. My whole career is in spiral notebooks. I have a <laughs> few hundred of them, you know, and all those notes and all those reflections, and it has an impact. And you know, kind of layer by layer, there's that great quote that you learn line by line. Precept by precept, here a sure. little, there a little. And so it's not like there was any flash bang moment where all of a sudden I thought small and now I think big. It's kind of gradually. It is a grew. gradual process. You know, there are all kinds of examples in scripture, you know, of Saul of Tarsus actually being struck blind and then being instructed and turning around and becoming Paul the Apostle. And right. for every one story you have like that, you have millions like us <laughs> who pick it up a little bit at a time, right? you know, until it becomes our own. And so just as, it, as we got exposed to different thinking, different perspectives, we started internalizing those things. We read, you know, and continued to read. That's why I enjoy your books. I mean, I think, Thanks. I think you have a gift for your communication, your writing, and your insight. Oh, thank you. I love how you break it down into pieces. I guess you make this part a commercial for Seabold Enterprises. But, <laughs> but uh, and I don't impress that easily. And I've read all the great authors, and, and you really do a wonderful job oh, thanks. reviewing the things that you do and making it bite-sized. I'm you simple. Know? I have to have it bite-sized. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, okay. <laughs> otherwise, I yeah. can't understand my own writing. <laughs> I appreciate it. You can sell that to somebody who will buy it maybe later. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I know you've done a lot of thinking, a lot of preparation to get to where you can articulate things the way and have the insight to articulate what you articulate. But I appreciate it. It's good for our company. And, <clears throat> but anyway, you know, back to it. It's just by degree, by degree. And then uh, one day you look up and you notice you think differently than most of the people around you. And then it strikes you, I think, if you're thinking right, and if you're raised right, it strikes you that you have a responsibility to try and help others go through that same process. Kind of, can you walk us through the chronology? Because I know you were an athletic director at San Jose State. And then can you walk us through that piece and then how you, how you were in, in, introduced to the, the industry? And let's talk about, now I'm going to wipe my mouth every once in a while. You just have to deal with it, D. Um, <laughs> you... Uh, you know, I wasn't an athletic director, I was an associate athletic director. Associate, okay. And uh, there are a couple of those. Okay. And then there's the AD. Okay. And, you know, Santa did, because I was paid 1200 a month, 14400 a year to do that work. And what year, what year was this, uh, Rich? That would have been 76, 77, okay. 78, you know, okay. the late 70s. And uh, then I got married in December 79. We courtship for about a year prior. And then... Her dad's counsel, admonition, <laughs> direction, warning, all of <laughs> warning. those things that it might have been. And the father-in-law warning. Yes. And uh, <laughs> the wonderful man, my second father. And it was, it was then that we really, and then, like I said, during our honeymoon, we had this reflection about wanting to do something together and find something. What were you going to do initially? Did you want to be the AD at the school? Is that the, was that the goal? No, I, did, I had a side, little side business going that wasn't doing too well, and she was working um, as an administrative assistant for, for someone we knew who had given her a job, mm -hmm. and, and we were just getting by. And I mean, our expenses were eleven, twelve hundred a month, and you know, we were just trying to put it together. Sure. That's why our first savings plan was eleven dollars and fifty nine cents. I mean, it was sure it wasn't much. Or little books we used to get, little passbook yeah, savings. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. I do. Remember. Write it down ten dollars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, ten sounds good from back then. Yeah, but it's as we as we looked at at what we wanted to be, you know, it's, then you, you know, and I wasn't a particularly prayerful person at that point, but there was this longing in both of our hearts, and so I think we tend and inclined to think maybe, or to watch a little more closely, you know, but a friend of mine, the guy who played the music in our wedding, says, you know, I bumped into this company, they've expanded from Georgia, uh, you know, 
you know, I think you ought to take a look at it. You know, and it took him four tries to finally get us down there. And well, you were a rich associate athletic director. Yeah, you didn't need the money. Raking it in. You're raking, saving eleven bucks a month. We You're were on a roll. Eleven fifty nine. Eleven fifty. I'm sorry, stand corrected. And so <laughs> that wasn't until after I met him. He okay. was the guy who set up the program. Oh, okay, there you go. Yeah. And uh, and then we sat in a meeting, and you know, and that if I had a flashbang, it was probably during that meeting. There was something about what I heard, and it wasn't pretty. It wasn't slick in the slightest. The actual two guys, one of them being my friend that gave the presentation, um, ended up getting in an argument over what the guidelines were for the promotions, which was fascinating to watch these two. (laughs) During the meeting. Buffoons, yeah, give the meeting, you know. And that reality, you know, changed my life. But I saw something and I felt it. I got a confirmation. And I trusted that feeling. And so we started part-time to pay off our Visa card and get a couch. A few months later, we had 30000 in savings. That doesn't sound like much to wow. people now. A few months later? Yeah, a few months later. Jeez. But they, that was two years of my income. Wow, yeah. I can't even tell you how excited we were. Yeah. And, of course, then we made the transition to full-time. And yeah, after, I'll bet you did after yeah. two months, yeah. And then a little can't afford two, to go to work. A little over two years later, we had a million in savings. We were, wow. We were beside ourselves. So you came out of the gate like a rocket. Well, again, I got good mentoring right from the beginning. Remember, we had the character, so that meant we could build trust relationships with people. That's going to be exactly what you need, right? Then we wanted to win. We were willing to pay the price and work hard. People thought we were crazy we worked so hard, put in the hours. I had my wife by my side, so we weren't separated. We were joint in this. She brought her things to bear and ran operations and... And I brought kind of the field stuff, leadership stuff, that she was very capable of leadership in her own right. You know, and... That's still so fast, though, Rich. I especially mean, selling term insurance. Right. Before. How did you have the contact base to do that, just being an asso- a young well, associate? Well, good news. Yeah. Early in my career, um, my leader brought in a guy who was a truly like a Yoda of, of referrals. Okay. A master of third-party referral. And I listened to him like he was Moses coming down from the mountain. And to say I embraced it is an understatement, Hmm. you know? And so we really, truly, there are a lot of things I wouldn't say this about. We truly mastered how to reach through people. My, one of my mentors later commented about me when somebody asked why we had gotten where we'd gotten and done it so relatively fast. And he said, Rich gets them or their market every time. Hmm. And that's not true. You don't do anything every time. But the reality is we really were very consistent and developed the expertise, and we passed that expertise on to our team. And so most organizations are running out of good places to go all the time, and we never did. Wow. And then, then I really did work on mastering the understanding aspects of human nature and all so I could become an effective recruiter and teach other people to become effective recruiters. And then I, I longed for a system to make it, repetitive right. and more easily duplicatable. And, uh, and so we were really part of the architectural group that designed what we call our system today, our business format system, our way of doing business and building a company. And, uh, and so when you master the system and you mix in the right character and, you know, you have this, an amazing wife and, you, then you'd start, we started drawing other great couples to the team and developing in leadership. And we are believers and, you know, our mentors helped us think big. And What was it like to go from nothing, I mean, virtually nothing financially, to a yeah. million dollars, especially almost 40 years ago? That, yeah. was a, that, that really was a lot of yeah. money. It's still 39, a lot of money. Yeah, 38 30, years ago. Yeah. What was that like? I mean, did your self-esteem... <laughs> Keep up with your finance? It's interesting. Your finances? Part of it's exhilarating, right? And you have to be aware of it. I remember when we first started making twelve, thirteen, fourteen thousand a month. That was astounding to me. Sure, yeah. Uh, you know, something happened, Steve, is in 1984, in the end of the year. We, would all, we were on a written plan, and so that kept us focused. And, but at the end of the year, we'd review one more time what had happened that year. And we would look at the plan we'd already done for the following year. So it's 84, going into 85, it's New Year's Eve. We don't, we don't go out because 
too many crazy people are doing sure. too many crazy things. <laughs> so we stay home. And we were looking at it, and all of a sudden a thought struck me. And I grabbed a calculator, and I added what Cindy had been making when we started and what I had been making when we started. We added it together. And then I divided it into what we had earned that year. And it would have taken us 98 years wow. to have that same thing happen. 98. Wow. It's unbelievable. 